Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar uh, where we will be exploring the new business transformation framework from the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. My name is Ben Kellard, I'm the Director of Business Strategy here at CISL um, and I'm really delighted to be able to host you through this, through this webinar. For those of you that haven't come across um, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, uh, we've been around for over 30 years, we're part of the University of Cambridge and our purpose is to activate um, leadership globally to transform economies for people, nature and climate. And we do that through in four ways. So we both uh, educate leaders. We also convene leading uh, organisations together to look at how they can um, collectively shape the, both the regulation and financial uh, institutional markets to, to create a more sustainable economy. Um, we also accelerate innovation um, through both startups and bringing the best minds and, and industry uh, together to crack wicked problems. And then finally, we also create a, what we call foresight, which is around making the case, what do we need to be doing today in order to create a sustainable future tomorrow? And that's very much what today is all about. So we're sharing with you some of our um, foresight, which we're working on, which is looking at the whole role of business transformation. As we know, businesses are facing increasing um, uh, external pressures, um, high expectations from um, employees, from investors, from governments, from customers, um, in order to show how they are part of the solution, not part of the problem that we're facing as society. So today, Today, um, I'm really delighted to be joined by two um, great business leaders from two um, terrific uh, businesses. So, so first of all, we uh, are joined by Phil Ruxton, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Croda International, and also Steve Werner, who is um, Strategy and Integration Director at Dentsu International. A very warm welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Ben. Hi. Thank you. Hello. And we'll obviously be hearing more from um, Phil and Steve um, shortly. So what I'd like to do now is just give you a brief overview of the business transformation framework and a little bit about why we created it, but we'll be exploring that more during the Q&A in a moment. So we'll be, I'll be briefly explaining the framework. We'll then um, move into a panel discussion between me, Steve and Phil, and then we'll be um, exploring um, what some of the implications of that might be um, as well. So that's the, the flow for today. So the, the framework really was developed in order to think about how is it that businesses are transforming. The research we've done revealed that I think businesses realise that the current role of business isn't functioning well. And um, but what does good look like? What do businesses? What does good look like for business? That was unclear. And so businesses weren't really able to get a clear sense of where is their current performance, what does good look like, and how to get there. And so that's why um, we started to think about how can we create a framework to help answer those questions. And so the um, Business Transformation Group, which is a group of leading businesses that we brought together, which includes Dentsu International, Croder International, also IKEA Inca Group and Majid Al Futain. And to, they, we came together to really balance out both what is the academic foundation for what a leading business needs to look like, but also how is that practical and rooted in real business practice? And so we collaborated together in order to create this um, transformation framework. So what it looks to do is really looks around, um, really we've identified um, 12 areas of business transformation. So these are 12 areas which um, businesses can look at in order to transform um, their, their role. And so I just wanna briefly walk, through, walk you through them, which you can see there on the, on the visual. So the first one is the purpose and values of the business. Actually, what is it there to do? What's the primary goal of the, of the organization? The second one is around corporate strategy and innovation. So how is that purpose being translated into corporate strategy and driving the innovation across the business? The third is senior leadership. So what are the capabilities and behaviors and how are senior leaders demonstrating leadership um, across the business? The fourth is what we call environmental and social parameters. What do we mean by that? Parameters are really the boundaries within which a business executes its strategy. So what are those, what are those, um, those parameters? And so they are, um, what we're identifying here is increasingly reflecting leadership is, what are those environmental or social limits that the business needs to operate within, such as being net zero or nature positive? 
The fifth area is accountability and reporting. Um, so how is the business going about really embedding that business and strategy into the, in, um, into the business? And how's that accountability worked through in terms of roles and functions? The sixth area is around functional strategy and innovation. So once we've got the corporate strategy, how is that cascaded into be that functional or countries, geographies, strategies, and is reflected in those? The seventh area is operational leadership. So how is that really embedded into the core operations and business processes within the uh, across the organization? The eighth is the all-important people processes. So things like performance management, talent management, leadership development, and so on, and capacity building. How is the strategy and purpose embedded into those key people processes? The ninth area is financial management. So what are the financial decision-making instruments and tools which really govern decision-making, whether that's things like capital expenditure and so on? The 10th area is external stakeholder engagement. And so that's really around critically, how is the business both scanning and understanding the external environment through stakeholders, both feeding into the strategy and decision-making, but also how they're engaging with stakeholders to execute and deliver their purpose and strategy, be that through collaboration, through partnerships, through advocacy to shape the regulatory or create the right enabling conditions external to the organization. The 11th area is around investor engagement. So recognizing that, of course, bringing investors with the business and creating the right investor base is critical to the journey. So how is it the businesses are, what sort of investors are they attracting? What sort of dialogue and engagements they're having with their investors in order to um, activate their purpose and strategy? And then the 12th and final area is really underpinned by individual and collective leadership. So looking at what are some of the core principles that really underpin that. Um, and that what we're looking at there is, is integrating some of our other thing across um, the CSL, which is uh, capturing our leadership for sustainable future, which is looking at the core principles of um, um, leadership and taking into account both individual and corporate purpose, thinking about the place and context in which they operate, and then what we're identifying is sort of the key principles, things like being connected, being courageous, um, and those sorts of elements. And that's what we're sort of drawing out in the underpinned by that individual and collective leadership. So both an individual level, at a departmental organizational level, and beyond in terms of how those businesses are shaping the external context around them. So they're the sort of the 12, 12 areas. And just to give you a bit of a, a flavor then, what we've also broken that down into is, what are some of the responses to business as usual? So if business as usual is the conventional mainstream approach where the role of business is to maximize profit for shareholders. Um, and if that's the and primarily business success is um, understood through the metric of financial uh, performance alone, what are um, what are those what are the responses to that? And so we've identified through this and through our um, unleashing sustainable business um, papers, which we can send a link and share with you, is we've identified, if you like, four responses to that business as usual. So starting on the left-hand side, we've got short-term self-interest, or otherwise known as corporate social responsibility, if you will, which is where the core goal of the organization is short-term financial value maximization. So still very much in that sort of business as usual um, core goal. And sustainability is really peripheral to the core activity of that business, which is aimed at maximizing financial value for the shareholders. And so sustainability response or purpose is really a reactive approach to, um, if you like, navigate and pacify negative stakeholder pressure, wherever that's coming from, whether that's regulatory or otherwise, in a, albeit a very organized way, but is therefore peripheral to the core business. We then move on to more long-term self-interest, um, which is where the goal is still financial um, value maximization, but into the medium to long-term. And so we start to see in these business responses, a relationship where they understand their dependencies with, um, with social and natural value and, and capital, but they invest in it where there's that win-win territory, where they can prove that by investing in natural or social capital, that that will promote medium to long-term um, profits. And so it's about understanding those risks. And we've split that out into two, both developing that in that early stage and more mature stage or um, in this long term self-interest, otherwise known as enlightened shareholder value. So as we move through into the sort of more mature, it's still about that long term focus on financial value is the dominant role and purpose of the business. But they're also starting to consider well-being for society and the environment as critical enablers of that long term value proposition. 
So then the fourth and if you like final version is really if you like the full leadership and sustainability which is where the what's critical is that the business is no longer just looking at profit maximization and assuming that like business as usual that if they do that then the market will enable maximization of well-being that's the current thinking behind business as usual but instead with purpose-driven organizations they if you like internalize that purpose so they demonstrate what their unique and distinctive contribution is to um, well-being for all people and planet um, which is distinctive to them and they're, and they're delivering that profitably as a private sector business so that's the difference is the whole orientation is how are they using their core competence to serve society and so all of the um, decision making is aligned around that purpose and, and the value it creates for society so financial value is seen as both the means and, a, and an outcome to delivering the purpose rather than the ultimate purpose of the business and incidentally, that um, fourth category is also aligned with the first ever um, principle-based standard for a sustainable purpose-led business, which uh, was published under the British Standards Institute um, called PAS 808, which is free to download. So it's very much aligned with that. So we have these sort of four categories, if you like, of responses to business as usual. And of course, some businesses might progress through that on their journey. Some might leapfrog um, and they'll all be in different places. So that's why we call them types of responses to business as usual. So what we've done in the coming back to the framework is we've said, okay, so here are the 12 areas of business transformation. And what does that look like across each of these four areas? And so that we, and what is the evidence you would see in businesses that were in those different stages of responses? And so the business can start to say, well, what best describes us? Where are we across those 12 areas? And once they've understood where they are, can start to think about, well, where do we want to be? Where are our aspirations? Do we want to be purpose-driven throughout? Or actually is our aspiration to be long-term self-interest? And then start to think about how do we then close that gap and we'll come on to that um, more later but that's the, the thinking behind um, the framework so just to give you an example of what that looks like and we're sharing today the preliminary diagnostic so there's two versions of this there's the preliminary diagnostic which we're publishing today and then there's the more fuller more um, detailed um, uh, uh, framework which we're looking to publish later later on and we're in the process of beta testing this, which is why we want to share it. We'll be hearing from Steve and Phil around their experiences of beta testing it. So as you can see here, we've got the first two of those categories of 12 categories I described. So let's take um, purpose and values. And you can see it asks, first of all, what's the question it's trying to answer? So it's to what extent um, do the business high level, highest level goals and decision-making parameters explicitly set out to improve people's lives while operating within the natural boundaries set by um, the planet? And so what you'll see is we start to set out what would you see if you were in um, short term self-interest, long term self-interest developing and so on. What would be that evidence? And then again, for corporate strategy and innovation, what are some of the things that you might um, be seeing? Um, so, for example, within um, on purpose and um, values in that short term self-interest, you might see there's a short term financial value uh, maximization is either an explicit um, goal of the business. Or it might be implicit where it's part of its perception of its view of um, fiduciary duty um, through to maybe purpose driven which is around setting out a clear ambition um, and a distinctive strategy that contributes to long-term well-being for all people and planet and its distinctive contribution to it that's what you'd be seeing as an explicit um, statement under being a purpose driven goal so that gives you a bit of a, a flavor um, of the overall um, uh, framework so, so now what we'll be doing is, is exploring how th this is being used in the, in the business and in, in businesses. And um, so now I'd like to, um, uh, we can now yeah, um, move into the panel discussion. I'd like to just explore and bring in um, Steve and, and Phil to explore further what their experiences are of, of, um, of this. Now, if I can maybe turn to you first, Phil. Phil, I know you've had a really you know, interesting you know, career at Croda and you've and you've worked in various commercial roles in Croda, um, and that since 2021 you've moved into the Chief Sustainability um, Officer position. I would say, Phil, maybe you could give us a start by um, maybe just outlining, tell us maybe a little bit about Croda um, and the journey that the, that the business has been on on sustainability and your role within it. Is that okay? Yeah, no, that's fine, Ben. Thank you, and, and hello, everyone. I, uh, forgive me, I've got a slight cold, so um, if I'm sounding a bit gravelly. Um, look, look, it's really nice to be here, and you know, really pleased to be part of the the launch of this framework. Um, and it's been a really 
interesting exercise for Crowder to be part of as well. Just for those who don't know Crowder, um, you know, we, we strive every day to live our purpose, smart science to improve lives. We're a, a specialty chemical specialty ingredient company focused on uh, consumer and life science markets. And a lot of our high performance technologies power the brands that everyone uses every day. Um, our, one of the important things to, to think about here just for a moment is your know, purpose is very much aligned with culture. Um, for those of you who know Crowder, our heart remains, we're a FTSE 100 company, but our heart remains in, in Yorkshire, in the north of England. Um, and the, the culture stems from that. You know, we are very much a pragmatic, get on with it type company. Um, and so, you know, very keen to see how this can actually translate into what we need to do within the organisation. We've been sustainable, if you like, from when we first started back in 1925. Our first raw material was a waste stream from the wool industry, wool grease to make lanolin. Um, and I'll suggest that it's serendipity rather than planning that over the years we've, we've built up a lot of sustainability assets. One of the key ones being our use of more bio-based raw materials and petrochemical derived raw materials. But our formal sustainability journey probably started in response to our customers in the early 2000s. We launched our first sustainability report in 2006, 2007. I was part of the um, team who pulled that together and I've been connected to the sustainability strategy and, and, and reporting ever since then. Um, I, a lot of my time, as you say, has been in the, um, in the commercial side of the business, primarily in our materials business. Um, supplying performance ingredients into, into uh, various materials where sustainability is right at the heart of it. Um, the transformational moment for Crowder is probably when we connected and realised um, how sustainability was actually at the heart of the corporate strategy. Uh, and we launched our commitment to be climate, land and people positive in 2020. And that was a 10 year uh, commitment. For a can-do company like Crowder, that was a bit scary because it was setting very high ambitions. We weren't quite sure how to get there. If we're honest, we're probably still not quite sure how to get to some of them. Um, but the, 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 the discussion from there, the, our aim was a broad-based uh, approach. So we look at climate, land, nature and people. Uh, we're thinking about restoration rather than just do less bad um, and looking to connect it to the planet's blueprint of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and, you know, it's a terrible cliche to say it, but we're on that journey and we're also on that journey to, to become more purpose led. Um, and I won't pretend for a moment that we're there, um, but that's been why it's been so useful to work with CICL and the Business Transformation Group in this. Phil, thanks very much indeed. I know it's been, a, as you say, a, a fascinating um, journey that you've, that you've been on. Um, thank you, Steve. If I could maybe turn to you, it'd be great to hear a, a bit more about then to international's journey yeah. and um, yeah you know, and and uh, your 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 role in that over to you. Certainly, uh, can you hear me? I apologize, I dropped off a little bit earlier, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the webinar. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Dentsu, uh, we're one of the largest digital media and communications networks. Uh, we work with uh, ninety five of the world's top one hundred advertisers, and uh, we have a range of service lines including um, media and creative and customer experience so we're active across 146 countries um, headquartered uh, in in japan um, and with about uh, over 70,000 employees so that's just a quick intro for us uh, i joined uh, dentsu uh, this this year in in june uh, in the social impact team uh, we're we're uh, in charge of implementing our social impact strategy for 2030, which was uh, uh, formulated back in 2021. It was structured around uh, three key pillars. So those, those being sustainable world, which includes our net zero target and uh, target to uh, reach people with campaigns that promote uh, sustainable consumption and then we have fair and open society which includes our uh, DEI targets such as uh, 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 gender gender targets for, for management and and then also digital for good recognizing as a, as a digital communications company uh, that impact in, in, uh, in reaching uh, uh, people to upskill um, especially young people uh, with, with with those skills 
we Denso International is, as I said, part of a larger larger network and has been operating for the business outside of Japan up until the end of last year. And this year, uh, we're in the process of integrating uh, with the Japan business as one one Denso, uh, which is just one more country. On it, but, but of course, as our headquartered uh, country, it's uh, uh, obviously a very key stakeholder and there's lots of different companies and a lot of breadth and variety of the business uh, based in Japan. The social impacts and uh, which was called the uh, sustainability strategy on the Japanese side um, was was set and agreed in 2021 but as part of this integration journey that we're on uh, we've embarked on a, a new materiality assessment uh, this this year and also uh, introduced a new value creation model. So integrating uh, those social uh, impact theme areas, but also explaining more about uh, how we go about uh, creating and achieving those ambitions for 2030 and, and beyond. So that's that's a lot of what uh, my my role has been is as helping with the the integration side and I think that this uh, framework is a really, it's an opportune time to revisit and, and check where, where, we, where we think that we're at and uh, where we're going with our, with our colleagues in Japan. Thank, thanks, Steve. That's re really helpful context. I think fascinating how, as you say, you're, you're, it's very different types of businesses in terms yeah. of the industries you're in, the structure and so on, but all on a similar, really pushing their ambition and so much. And it's been fascinating, I think, also through the group, see how different businesses like yours and IKEA, Inca Group and so on are on that journey and the challenges they're facing. So if we maybe um, turn to um, the, uh, the, the the framework or what, and just set the context before we do. So in terms of the journeys you've been on, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about what are some of the challenges that you faced in terms of that to, to transform the business what, what are some of the the, the the broad challenges that you've that you've faced maybe um Bill, maybe i'll turn to you first yeah and, and you could start by saying how long have we got because you know as as all organizations listening into this would, would recognize there's a lot of challenges um I, i'm going to pick up on j just a couple of those and i think probably the first one to recognize is the short versus long-term lens um and, and the challenges of ensuring that you're meeting the needs of your stakeholders in the short term while ensuring that you're developing that longer term um, approach to both purpose and delivery of, um, of, your, of your sustainability strategy frankly and, 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 and having that at the heart of your corporate strategy and, and that is a real you know particularly today you know times for a lot of um, organizations and economies are, are tough and there's a lot of pressure from certain stakeholders be that your customers um, your shareholders or your employees um, to focus on some of the short term, which drags you back to the left hand side of the, uh, the, the frameworks piece, um, while ensuring that everything is still aligned to the long term. And, and, and part of that is a challenge of understanding, well, kind of where are we? What are the priorities and, and how do we measure that we're on track to stay on the long term? Um, and, so, and so that's the, the first piece, that short versus long term. And then the other piece, really, the, the, the challenge is that the competing uh, needs, the competing impacts and dependencies of different stakeholders. Um, and, you know, it will be different for different companies. We're a UK listed FTSE 100 company. Um, and clearly we have stakeholders in our investors um, who have um, certain expectations and benchmarks and metrics that they would look to Croda for. Um, one of our other key stakeholders, our employees, may look at that through a different lens and there's a different materiality with our employees. And then obviously, you know, we're only here in a way because of our customers. Um, and, and so there are, there are very many competing expectations at any moment in time between different stakeholders. And that's what a purpose-led company's got to try and navigate through, bringing stakeholders with them, keeping an eye on the long term. Thanks, Phil. Yes, that's right. And, and um, I guess obviously there's so many external pressures that are buffeting businesses um, and also there are still businesses that are operating within market and regulatory failures, which are creating headwinds as well. That's all very much a reality, isn't it, that you need to operate within. Um, yes. 
So, Steve, what, what will be your take? What do you feel is some of that? I realize you're, you're new to the business, but I'd be interested to get your, your take on what are some of the sort of transformational challenges you, that you're, you're finding. All of that resonates with me, and I think that that's captured well in the executive briefing that you have uh, for the framework as well. Those, those sort of dueling pressures uh, with the, the wanting to, to focus on the long term, but you also have to, to balance uh, the short term demands and those, those shocks that, that, that keep coming up and take your, all of your stakeholders together with you on that journey. That, that very much resonates with my experience, not only with uh, this company, but uh, my previous company working in sustainability as well. I think another uh, challenge is uh, measuring, measuring performance and the availability of, of data and the, having the high level high level commitment and, and wanting to get there, but the investment required in order to get the, the robust data that you would need uh, to be able to manage these these issues effectively is another, another big challenge. We, we have a, a management strategy of saying we're a business to business company, but our, our goal is to be business to business to society. But how do we, how do we get that? That's a, that's a great, uh, it's 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 something to get behind. Certainly motivating as an employee, but then to say what is this? What is this impact? How do we make sure that we're having the most positive impact? What can we do to change that? I think that that um, that data piece can be quite challenging. That's really helpful. And what I'm hearing almost is sort of threads, I guess, running through what you're saying is almost coming back to what's the sort of value proposition, how you how you aligning that with different stakeholder expectations and how are you demonstrating that and how you can find in that sort of golden thread that runs through that to help you not just tell a story, but also evidence it as well, I guess, as, as, as part of that. And, and that's super. And I can imagine also as well in complex organizations like yours, it's not just the external stakeholder um, network, it's also the internal, you know, within, within sort of complex um, corporates and so on. So, Super. And if we if we then um, turn to the the framework itself, what's your sense of what what problem do you feel it's trying to solve in in the context of that business transformation? Um, what, what yeah? What what do you feel? Maybe feel again if I can maybe turn to you to kick us off. What yeah? Yeah. So I, I think it's it's really interesting when when most organisations talk about sustainability, um, we'll talk about the themes and the progress that we need to make towards reducing our impacts on planet and society or restoring some of the negatives for planet and society. And so uh, for organizations who are active, leading, engaging um, in, in, in thinking about this, there's a huge focus on, okay, how do we get to net zero? You know, what are the, the actions we've got to take to get to net zero? How do we become nature positive? How do we improve positive social impacts? But when you actually get down to it, you know, part of this is the organization match fit to be able to make that um, leap to focus on those outcomes while still managing the expectations and satisfying all stakeholders. Um, and as you, you said, Ben, earlier on, you know, as a purpose led organization, you are prioritizing some of these things in a different way, hopefully for the long term, hopefully to meet the needs of all stakeholders. But a lot of the, 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 the effort and the, and, and, and the, the discussion and the, the, the support that is out there focuses very much on the steps you need to take to get to net zero. Not necessarily how's the organization set up, how match fit is it, and what are the elements that need to be transformed within the organization, we'll call them the enablers, um, and certainly in Crowd we call them the enablers, that make it easier to get there. And it doesn't cause organizational chaos, stress, it'll still be chaos and stress, by the way, but minimize those uh, on the journey. So and I think that's where the, um, the, the, the framework from um, the Business Transformation Group is, is hopefully helping to address. That's really helpful. And I think it also resonates with the uh, not only the Business Transformation Group, but a lot of the leaders that are coming on our programs. That's what we're finding is that whereas maybe 10 years ago, we were a lot of it was around why is sustainability an issue? Why is it urgent? What are the drivers around the why? I think now it's very much around the how. So I think business leaders are you know, far more aware of the existential issues facing their business. And now they really want to get into how do I do this? How do I navigate all that short term, long term uncertainty, complexity and so on? And so it's really, um, really interesting to hear, Phil. Thank you. 
Steve, what, what's your, your sense? That that resonates or anything anything you'd want to add in terms of what problem you feel that the, the framework's trying to solve? Absolutely. Uh, no, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I think for for me, I think this this tool would uh, companies face an increasing demand of from from customers as 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 part of supply chain due diligence plus all of these ratings we have a lot of information and it can be as phil said sort of a, oh, do you have a do you have a net zero strategy and, and, and go through without the the wider why of what what you're trying to do and what what you're trying to accomplish and i think what's nice about this is it's not answering to to someone else, it's a self-reflection, self-diagnosis. So it's it's really a tool that you can uh, bring there for an honest uh, reflection. And everyone everyone's going to have uh, a, a different take of, of of where where they think the performance lies. And I think that it because it's spread out over twelve themes, it allows for not trying to aggregate into a, a larger score, but really just showing performance in, in those those 12 different areas and, and being able to reflect um, much much more specifically. Uh, I, I think that those are uh, some of the be benefits that stood out to me. Great, Thank, thanks Steve. Yes, and I, and I guess when we uh, conducted some research prior to this as, as, a, as a group, it's maybe worth sharing with, with uh, the audience is how, what we found is that a lot of the indices, sustainability ESG indices that are out there, are for UC Safefield very much sort of focused on the what often. Okay. Yeah, so looking at things like you know your carbon impact or what have you and so on, which obviously is very important. Um, but it was less of an emphasis on the how. So actually, what does good business transformation mean? Where is the business on that journey and so on? So those that are really wanting to accelerate their journey, um, how can they really get that sense of where are they starting from? What do they need to prioritize as an organization and so on? And to try to you say both also i think even just being clear about what are those enablers what should i even be looking at let them know what good looks like for them what should i be considering what are the different levers i can pull within an organization uh, and so on to try to get you say, that level of discrimination not just the business overall but what are those elements where are we maybe further ahead or, or doing well where are we maybe lagging behind what's the relationship between them and so on super so i guess and, and i know you're um, both and because as a group we're, we're now obviously testing the framework and um, we're very much in that kind of beta testing mode and, and you're both as I say in different organizational contexts and the different stages in that sort of testing but um it'd be great to get your 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 sense of um you know what's been your experience of using the framework um in in your journey um so maybe just a mixing up um steve i maybe just uh, turn to you what's what's been your experience so far and where, where are you on your on your use of the framework we we are still uh, very much in in the early stages so as i mentioned earlier our our goal for using this framework is going through uh as first our team here uh based out of the international markets uh to do a sense check of where we think our performance is as a as a wider wider group and then engage in with our colleagues um, on the on the japan side and and say how do how do you feel about this do you feel that this the are we on the same page of where we think our our performance is so that's the that's the wider plan i think very one of the unique aspects about this is the asking you to place yourself <laughs> and I think that that's been the biggest job. right now we're going through it and, and, and finding the, the the proof points and and finding out that gap analysis of what's the information that we don't have here we're going to need to of course engage um, other colleagues throughout the business but when it gets down to it I think everyone goes well which because as you start putting the data in you're putting it towards 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 one box or the other and I think that that's probably going to be one of the more uh, interesting exercises uh, as as a team to come together and land, land that. And then, and as I say, it's still in the process. We have not, we have not finished that ourselves. Right, thanks. Yes, and I think it's so, in my experience, um, it's really important that businesses make that sense themselves of where do they think they are, as you said, and have that conversation um, to be able to inform that conversation of what's important to us, where are we, and, and, and so on. It might, um, and I think there's always a risk that um, organizations score themselves in a flattering way. I think partly because businesses are very positive, you know, go get them sort of cultures often. 
Uh, and often they don't know what they don't know. And I think, again, that's with the framework was part of what we're trying to achieve is, well, here's the evidence you'll be looking for. So go find the evidence in your business and then you self-reference initially, where do you think that places you? Um, uh, that's right. And, and I guess it's worth, worth sharing that one of the ways in which businesses can, um, of course, do that is almost like a bit of a spider diagram or a radar where they can say, have the different 12 areas um, coming out like forks and then rate themselves. Where are they from short-term self-interest to purpose-driven? Where are they? So you get a real kind of, you know, spider diagram, which gives them a very clear visual sense of, of, of where they are um, and help to inform those conversations as a shared frame of reference between colleagues and different, you know, different functions, departments and roles. So um, thanks, Steve. Phil, it'd be great to hear a bit more about, um, yeah, your experience of working with it. So what's fascinating about using this framework is, you know, and as it was designed through CISL is this should have something in it for all different types of organizations with different cultures and strategies. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Croda's kind of coming from a slightly different angle, probably the other end of the spectrum actually to an organization like Dentsu, which is right, let's get on with it. Um, and so, you know, credit the support of the senior leadership team and the board. Um, we were very interested in not just the progress against our public targets, the thematics, and you know, so far the milestones, the short-term milestones we're, we've been reasonably successful at, but the question was really, you know, are we confident about our ability to progress forward um, to hit some of the really big challenging stuff 2030 and beyond? Um, and so this came at a, a, a really good time to, to have that moment of reflection. Um, and our approach has, has been very much to try and take it to test the temperature of where we think in terms of being, as I say, match fit to get us to 2030 and beyond but also then have that discussion with um, particularly the senior leadership team, that will get wider, um, on, okay, so which elements here do we think we need to then move on and, 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 and do more to give us the best chance of, of being successful um, against the targets and, and most importantly, meeting stakeholder expectations and, and, and helping them on that journey as well. So there's a really interesting one I wanted to pick up with Steve actually, which is, Steve, you were talking about that, that moment of self-reflection and looking for evidence we've gone through this so we took an earlier uh, draft effectively and took the the um, um if, you, if you like the high level approach and one of the biggest challenges we found when we a lot of this was through qualitative interviewing and then gathering the the evidence through that um was to ensure that we were being honest with ourselves about evidence-based positions versus aspirational based positions because it's very easy particularly when you're engaging through a senior team to talk about where you hope to be or hope you are or want to be rather than actually where are you and I, and I, you know it's something i'm sure as dentists who are working through this it, it'd be interesting to reflect on that and just say okay how do we how do we make sure it's evidence-based and, um, and that, that's been a challenge for us um, but it's been that was really useful actually no it's that but i i i certainly imagine and there's I would say that there's uh, cultural differences as well from uh, my experience. I've worked with uh, Japanese companies uh, in in the past, and the I, th I think that the aspirations are are great, but as you say, it's the the, the push for evidence I think is a lot uh, stronger, um, perhaps the the on the European side rather than just a uh, a confidence in in performance and 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 the Putting that on the employees and, and 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 engaging, but the the demand for proof is certainly much much stronger uh, over here on on the European side. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and it, that that has been really interesting for us. And our, our outcome, um, Ben, you talked about the spider diagrams. We ended up with a heat map. Just another way. Of demonstrating the data, but it was a heat map where it was then, we could then have a healthy discussion around the senior leadership team in one room to say, does that feel like where we are? Does everyone agree, you know, where do we want to be? And I, and I think one of the really interesting learnings from that was actually when you got to it, there was quite a lot of consensus when people really stopped to think and reflect, as you say, Steve, and say, actually, yeah, no, we, we're there. It is absolutely clear we're on a journey at different stages for different parts of the organization. I think what gets really interesting though then is the discussion, Ben, you mentioned earlier about, well, where do we want to be and, and, and when? And you know, 
it's very easy to go, oh, we want to be furthest right on everything. All 12 must be, you know, um, uh, pioneering and, and, and so on. And actually, you've got to stop and think, and hopefully people listening into this will recognise this, that you are in an ecosystem where you are, you know, totally influenced by where your various stakeholders are and where their expectations are. And, and I think one of the, the opportunities um, taking forwards on this is to, you know, is to engage externally and have those discussions both about where, say, our customers are on the same journey. Because if there's a massive misalignment with customers, you can't be too far behind or too far ahead of the people who are going to actually help you derive that impact. Um, and so that's, that, that's an interesting thing um, for the future. Um, but certainly it's, it's created a very lively discussion and it's meant that as we're reviewing our sustainability strategy overall, we're building into that, not just where do we want to get to on the themes, you know, net zero, actually how do we get there and what are the projects and programs, but also have we got the enablers right, so we're bringing that into the same discussion and that's been really useful for us. That's really helpful, Phil. And I think the other thing, hopefully, the framework pulls out, as you say, is that businesses are essentially part of a web and network, aren't they, as you say, dependent on a whole series of actors as well as on society and nature. And it needs to be seen as such, it needs to help think about what's yeah. it. And it's that leadership piece around proactively playing into that network, isn't it? Not passively sitting back and going, oh, we'll, we'll move when one of our key stakeholders or our stakeholders align, but actually proactively having that discussion and engaging with them um, in, as, as part of that, um, as part of that piece of leadership. And, and I think the other things I want to maybe just, just draw out, I guess, from um, some of the learning so far, is, well, I know when we were putting the, the uh, framework together, it's probably worth sharing with people that one of the balances we were trying to strike was between, on the one hand, um, making it comprehensive enough, so there's enough descriptions of what evidence you'd be looking for, so it's both people know what they're looking for, and it's discriminating between, well, is it that or is it is it that? So it needs some level of detail, but also people are busy. Is it easily digestible? Let's make sure it's not overwhelming as well. So how do we get that balance right? And so that's one of the things we've been trying to strike that balance. And we'd, we'd really appreciate feedback from people who are um, looking at it would, would, would be great to get that. That was one. I think the other is the sort of generic and specific. So we want this to be relevant to all businesses. In fact, we also feel that actually it's relevant potentially to all organizations in different sectors is one of the things we want to test, but we've um, focused on private sector. So how is it both generic, so it could apply to such different businesses as your own, but also in a way which translates into the language of the business users. And of course, some people might, for example, use profits or value creation or whatever the language might be. Some might land, some might not, and some might need therefore a bit of translation, you know, so, um, and therefore, I think that's one of the reasons why we want to be clear about what's the principles behind uh, the framework in, in the report, so that people sort of leading that process, whether that's maybe a C-suite member or a CSO or a strategy lead or whoever it might be, can use that adaptation to the business and say, okay, here's how it is in the framework, but in our organisation, this is the language we'd use for it to bridge the gap into their, their, their context. I think is that, is that something you both sort of recognise? How do you sort of you know, balance that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point about, you know, trying to make sure we've been trying to make sure this is applicable to, as you say, many organisations, at least many different types of businesses. The challenge then is that language, because you, 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 you're you ending up with some naturally some quite generic language within this. And you do need a bit of a dictionary to translate between what that generic language is versus what you say in your organisation. That's no different from any other. Um, external input, but that, that that's quite an important piece to get right and maybe spend a little bit of time preparing, say actually how do we use the right words for the organisation, translating from this maybe more generic framework, I think that's really important. Um, the, the, the other piece um, I was reflecting on Ben was um, you talk about using this at the organisation level, I think there's some, there's potentially some future opportunities as well to think across um, uh, sectors and look at some of the, the key elements of where a sector maybe lacks you know or is further to the left in this and as a sector you know can we help them support um, a wider ecosystem to, to, to move forward as well um, because part of this is you know one of our stakeholders if you like is our, is our, is our sector and ensuring that you know we're, we're, we're moving making more change and moving forwards you know beyond just our own boundaries so, so that's an interesting, just sorry, just to come back to one other point then, I can't overemphasize the importance of kind of having a sense of culturally how 
an organization would approach this and the different culture steve you've described in dentsu to to Croda, it works for both but it's going to work really differently and just a bit of reflection actually what sort of culture are we are we a pragmatic kind of do get on and learn as we go or are we a, a, an organization that likes to plan analyze reflect and, and before implementation that will be massively helpful in 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 in, in thinking about how you then would use this framework good point i think it's there for people like yourselves who are, who are leading on using it you say using your judgment say how do we want to use it to what purpose how do we adapt it to our culture and our language and so on and i think that's the other thing isn't it is around how do you balance the breadth and depth of engagement in the business? Because of course, the, the, the deeper and broader you go in engaging colleagues, that might be, for example, you engage with your finance director to find out how we, or investor relations, how we invest, you know, and so on, get their view, because they're then engaged in the conversation, they're then bringing their insights and you're bringing their, their a, a consensus on, well, where do we think we are? But of course, the broader and deeper you go, the more time consuming it is, and that needs managing. So that balance between breadth and depth, um, I think is part of that conversation feels like an important element and i think the other thing is what it um where the roles it can play and we catch this a bit in the blog but i think we've talked a bit about can help with the diagnosis where are we today we've also talked about phil as you mentioned how might that inform where we want to get to because it might say well actually okay we've got a purpose and strategy is it good enough actually you know do we need to go back to the drawing board on that or actually we think it is it's more about what the enablers to deliver that um and where where are we trying to get to um which can then in turn, you can create almost like a bit of a gap analysis. You almost have your two spider diagrams. Where are we? Where do we want to get to? Create the gap analysis. And then that can then maybe inform a business transformation program where you're then saying, okay, well, which, you know, which enables are we going to focus on? And if we're at, say, short term uh, profit maximization, what does the next stage look like? Could get, maybe give indicators of what moving forward might look like. But that still all requires, as you say, judgment to say, well, what levers do we pull? Why, given our culture and so on? Um, Steve, I wonder if there are any further reflections, anything you want to kind of add in terms of, um, yeah, how, you know, maybe watch out for people listening on the or considerations when, when applying this in a business, anything you want to add? I, I think what, what you were, were saying about the flexibility and, and having it apply for all organizations, I think when at first glance, it, it seemed, uh, I was, I was surprised at the, the simplicity of of the structure but it allows for that flexibility and i i imagine that for our our organization we're going to need to tailor for different audiences so we can use this uh probably at the start for that real exhaustive gap analysis and then we'll have to tailor that and i think it'll be as as you look into listing up the proof points there'll be more salient or so it'll allow for a prioritization and then tailor that to an executive level audience tail that to the more uh, practitioner level audience at for for our colleagues you know, in in japan so i i listening to this conversation it, it it made me imagine thinking we're still in the early stages but we're probably going to have a lot of different versions <laughs> or, or 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 possibilities uh through that and what we um what we submit and say this is the, the the final result i don't quite know what level uh will strike but i i i see it as it is i i do like that there is flexibility in in that sense rather than just this exhaustive questionnaire that doesn't really fit or or where you're answering a lot of questions that don't necessarily resonate with your your industry or your type of, of type of business this allows for teams to put together that story and the proof points themselves and then find the best way to engage with those different stakeholders internally yes good point and i guess a bit like google maps you can zoom in and out depending on the audience yeah. kind of saying <laughs> yeah. an exec team it might be here's the spider diagram um and then it might be the say you're working for, you know the finance team you might drill down more into well here's our evidence here's what good could look like for them and so it allows you to zoom in and out um super and and guys i guess just any just before we kind of close, any final thoughts in terms of if we think beyond how the, because the, also I guess we're, we're, we're working together, we're also validating, you're doing that kind of self-assessment and then we're, we're working with you to kind of also challenge that. And that's another role that organizations could do that with their partners um, to get that kind of external validation to sort of, if you like, just provide that, that sort of scrutiny. Um, 
but in terms of how it might be used you know um, more externally any, any other sort of final thoughts phil you mentioned for example potentially with customers it could inform that conversation or something any other sort of just final final thoughts on how else the business transformation framework might be used in terms of because we've obviously got a wider you know kind of sectoral economy to shift here well so i mentioned earlier that idea of the sectoral economy and and, and, and you know we're only going to make real impact if we're, we're we're in this together in different value chains and you know working in pre-competitive spaces with our peers and so on um in a way the fact is a generic language gives a common language and so you can have like the the united nations sdgs gave a common language to sustainability themes and where we've got to get to if this can help with a common language where you can have some conversations through a trade association, through a, a, a consortia about the areas that each party is trying to work on. And we, OK, and I get that. And, and, and then you can, it's a much easier way to then share best practice rather than, you know, at the moment, if I two years ago had a conversation with Steve and Steve talked about this, this language, forget Japanese English for a moment, just the language of, of, of business transformation. And I'd be talking about something totally different. We probably wouldn't even recognize there was commonality. And so in, in, in that way, I think this could be really useful to, to build a basis for a, 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 a common discussions. Thanks, so. and I think one of the interesting developments I also, I think even just in the last few weeks since um, uh, UN General Assembly in, in, in Climate Week is often there's been this gap between, we know globally we're increasingly clear what we need to achieve on carbon, on nature and so on, but then often it then drops straight to the organizational level. Then organizations are left with their complex value networks say, well, what's this mean for us? And as you say, different stakeholders will have different views because it's complex, right? Whereas I think the interesting development we've seen, for example, on Nature Positive by a consortium uh, with people like Business for Nature and World Economic Forum are saying, okay, here's what individual sectors need to do to create um, a nature positive future, it starts to give much clearer common language as well within sectors and say between investors and other stakeholders say, okay, now we're getting a clearer sense of what we need to achieve as a sector. And this could maybe play a role in terms of, okay, well, what levers do we need to pull? What's our role and contribution as a business? Potentially as part of consortium as well. And that's, I think, a really interesting development that can maybe provide that gap between the global challenge and the individual organizational challenge. Yeah. So, Steve, any final reflections from your side? No, I, I completely agree with what Phil said in terms of that common language. I think it, it, it's, it's uh, absolutely essential for getting everyone aligned both internally, and this is a self-diagnostic tool, uh, but it also has huge potential for uh, when you have that narrative and you and you come together in, as, as an organization across functions and, and have a common language, then you can start engaging uh, externally a lot more effectively and have those conversations within the industry and, and with, with customers in, in a way that will resonate a lot more so that that's that's the next step down the line but I see huge potential on on, on coming up with that uh, common narrative Super. thanks Steve well look thank you both very much indeed for your time this morning sharing your experiences uh, within your businesses uh, we were hoping to um, broadcast this on LinkedIn, but unfortunately the tech failed on us, um, but we'd love to keep the conversation going. So for those of you that um, are engaging with this, we'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what you think of the frameworks. As I said, we're very much testing and learning, so we'd love your feedback, how you might be using it in your organization. Um, so please do share that with us through the LinkedIn um, post. And also there's a huge amount of work's gone into this and, and it's been a real team effort um, from the Business Transformation Group members we've talked about, but also people like James McPherson, Victoria um, Hearth, Bianca Drotliff, um, Julian Secret and Katie Parker. There's been a whole team you know, behind this. And so I just also want to say a big thank you to all of them for all their hard work that's gone into this. So please do um, engage with us as this is a living, breathing um, document that we want to use to sort of share as part of us as a community. Think about how do we transform the role um, of business. So on that note, Gentlemen, I'll say thank you very much indeed and uh, looking forward to uh, continuing the debate um, both both online. And... Likewise, thanks, thanks for a great discussion. Thanks, Steve. Bye for now. See you soon. Bye. Bye.